Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm always excited to be here in this beautiful location talking about one of my most favorite topics, micromobility. Um, I'm Kerstin. I lead the Center for Future Mobility in McKinsey, which is our think tank on the mobility disruption. So we do spend all of our time on the future of mobility. It's a very broad topic. That's why we have 200 people globally that do very little else except work on the future of mobility. We cover a broad array of topics. Obviously, micromobility is one of them and it's very dear to our hearts, but we also talk about autonomous driving. We do different types of shared mobility. We think about electrification. We think about the future of software and vehicles and many, many other things. Um, and all of the work we do in that is, is basically in all of the things that you're going to see comes from a team that is part of our Center for Future Mobility. We have 45 people doing very little else except crunch numbers, analyze what the market is going to look like, look at investment patterns, and then also look at, um, uh, look at how consumer sentiment is evolving when it comes to different types of mobility. Today, um, I'm going to talk about 10 topics and I'm going to dive a bit deeper into three of them. So I'm going to talk, start talking about investments. What have we seen in the last couple of years? I'm going to talk about two wheelers and do a deep dive here. And when I say two wheelers, we're mostly talking about the e-moped kind of vehicle category. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about mini mobility. So vehicles that are a bit bigger. And we try to use that term mini mobility for anything that isn't really a scooter or a bike, but also isn't quite a car. So it's a bit smaller than a car. Uh, and then I'm going to do, uh, cover the another seven topics around market sizing, deep dives into bicycles and so on and so forth. And let me start to go into, um, into these three, which we put as a bit as, as focus topics up here. Um, investments. So lots of data here. Basically what, the, what you can see is you can see how much money has been invested into the different types of uh, micromobility. And we do a regional cut here. So we take a look at how has it evolved over time and how are the investments split between the different regions. And a few things that are interesting here, no surprise, all of the investments sort of peaked around the 2021, second half of 2021, early 2022 timeframe, and then things sort of went downhill a bit. You can also see that Asia is sort of starting to come back a bit more. So we see more uh, investments happening in Asia in, in H1 of 2023. We expect this to rebound eventually, but um, whenever you listen to the true investment professionals, I think they're still a bit skeptical about what is going to happen in the next couple of quarters. So it's rather something where we would expect the market to start slowly coming back next year and then maybe sort of come back for real uh, in the second half of next year. What is also interesting here is if you sort of compare the lines, right, you do see that a lot of investment actually went into Europe and Asia. And if we compare that to different types of mobility, micromobility is actually one of the few areas where you see that, that pattern. In most of the other types of mobility that we track, doesn't matter if we're talking electric vehicles, if we're talking batteries, if we're talking autonomous driving, 15 other things, you would see that most of the money actually went into US companies. Um, so it's an interesting thing to see that there is lots of activity going on in Europe and Asia, and a bit less so, at least in this sense, in the US. So in a positive note, I think there is still room to grow and there is still a lot of money to be invested in this space. We then took the same data and cut it differently. So you can again see sort of same data, same volume and investment, but this time we're cutting it by different types of micromobility. And we're looking at e-bicycles, we're looking at mopeds, we're looking at kick scooters, and we're also looking at mini mobility. I'll start with the last one first. So you sort of have to look really close to see the mini mobility line. It's basically at the very bottom of the, of the chart. So the message is not a lot of money has been invested into mini mobility yet. What you can also see is if you compare the, the other lines, it looks to be fairly consistent. So almost equal amounts have been invested into these different types of, of, of modes in, in micro mobility. You can see that the e-bikes actually peaked early on. And what you can also see is that the peaks were sort of always six months apart. So for some reason, the investment timings and the cycles were a bit different for the different modes of, of transportation and for the different modes of, um, of micro mobility. Talking about electric two wheelers. Now, this is data that we pulled from our survey team that does a lot uh, in consumer research when it comes to micro mobility and mini mobility and different types of mobility. This is data from Europe, but we do believe that it's actually uh, fairly consistent also with if we were to redo this for the US, what we would see here. 
First and foremost, we ask an electric two-wheeler, is this something that you have on your radar screen, something you want to buy? And as you can see, many people have it on their radar screen. So they are aware that there are different types of new vehicles out there, and they're actually thinking about purchasing one in the near future. We then also asked, um, what does that look like? Like, what, what is important? What are the key purchasing criteria that you would have? And you can see a long, 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 long list of different things. Um, and we looked into the top three here and then we're trying to sort of put out the top three and it's battery lifetime, it's purchase price and driving range. And then there's a lot of other things around availability. Can you actually charge these vehicles? Where can you park them? Uh, how quickly can you recharge them? Safety is an important one. Uh, battery swapping is an important one. Subsidies are an important one and so on. But just to put, point out a few patterns here, if you were to aggregate the different data points and the different criteria, you would actually see that everything around battery, so lifetime, recharging, um, and not only recharging is how quickly, but also how easily you can recharge it. Is it safe in terms of the battery? All of these trends or all of these topics around the battery are extremely important for consumers when they make a buying choice. So the more information a company can share about battery, the more quality assurance a company can give around the battery, the better, because this is very, very high up on the list. If we compare that funnily to, uh, to cars, in cars, we also still see that lifetime of the vehicle and of the battery and also range are quite important and charging anxiety is still a big topic, but it's sort of starting to decrease in importance. So we've basically passed the peak where the most, uh, the main thing that kept people from actually buying an electric vehicle was charging and battery related stuff. And we're now on to other things. So here in, in micro mobility, or especially in these two wheelers, it was, it's still a very important topic and people are really not worried about it, but at least they, they want to know and they want to be informed about it when they make a purchase decision. Um, we then also asked ownership preferences. So if you buy a vehicle or if you want to get a vehicle, how would you like to pay for it? And then also how would you like to own it? And what you can see here is um, one, the outright purchase. So people just paying for the vehicle in cash or with a different form and mode of, 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 of payment is quite dominant, especially in the, in the vehicles that they currently own. However, you can also see that across these three countries, the number is decreasing quite massively and is giving way to an extent to new types of ownership. And those new types of ownership are financing, are leasing and are subscription. And why is that? One, because uh, we do see a huge trend that in general, the, the more vehicles get electrified, the more people are actually willing to go for a financing or especially a leasing option. Because again, coming back to the battery topic, they don't necessarily trust the residual value of the battery and they don't want to have to front the risk of the battery being less performing or of lower value when they have to sell the vehicle again. And they don't want to take that risk up entirely on themselves. That's one. Um, I think in general, there's a broader trend towards more subscription, more leasing and so on. Um, but the other reason is also that the vehicle is obviously getting more expensive. So if you think about the price between a conventional vehicle and an electric vehicle, prices are always going up. And the more expensive the vehicles are, the more financing options you're going to need and you're going to want as a, as a consumer. Now, mini mobility, and I know it's not an official term. We sort of took micro mobility and tried to make it a bit bigger when we tried to create that term. Um, and mini mobility is basically every vehicle that is somewhat like a bit bigger than a bike and not quite a car, so anything in between. And we also do know that this is something that's still sort of growing a lot um, and, and there are still many, many form factors out there and we still don't really know what the final form factor is going to be. And in our mind, there's also going to be a coexistence of many, many different form factors for a fairly long time down the road. So. What we did here is we asked people, um, if you were to use a mini mobility vehicle, what type of a transport option would the trips that you would take with that vehicle actually cannibalize? Um, and uh, many, many answers or more than one answer were possible, but you can see that the private vehicle is actually the one thing that people are going to use most, or mo sorry, going to replace most when they actually do trips with these mini mobility vehicles. Public transit is another one that's a bit worrying, uh, I have to admit, especially for uh, from a city angle, but then everything else is actually ride hailing, there's car sharing, so there's mostly larger form factors. And then bicycles, kick scooters, and mopeds, so form factors that are actually smaller than the, uh, than the microcar, the mini mobility vehicles, they're at the bottom of the list. 
So what you can see is smaller vehicles can be a good alternative also to make cities and to ease congestion while still allowing people to keep quote unquote their own vehicle and have sort of a private space. And the main reason is that in such a vehicle, you're actually able to carry not only or to not only transport yourself, but maybe somebody else and also something while being sort of weather protected and having a bit of a safe space around you, but at the same time not doing something where you're moving around one person in a two-ton truck or in a large SUV. So it's sort of an intermediate solution, and that's why we are very excited about these types of vehicles. And we do think that, thinking back to the investment uh, space, there is actually going to go a lot of investment into mini-mobility in, uh, in the next couple of years, because these companies are now, they're starting to scale up, they're starting to push these vehicles quite internationally. And we do think that the, the market sizing and the market potential is actually pretty massive. Um, we also asked people, how would you use the, uh, the mini mobility vehicle? So not only what would you replace, but also what, you, what are the main use cases? And as you can see here, it's grocery shopping, it's leisure activities, it's commuting. And you can also see that some of these actually do overlap with what people would be using micro mobility vehicles for, maybe except for the grocery shopping and maybe except for the uh, leisure activities where you actually have something that's a bit larger than a backpack to carry. And then for commuting to work, you can also assume that the distances that people would use these vehicles for are much larger than how they would use a typical micro mobility vehicle. Um, and there's, there's many, many other use cases down there, but these three are basically the, the, the top of the list. And again, this shows a bit why these vehicles have a, a reason to, to be there and have a, a justification to exist because there are simply some things you cannot do with a scooter or some things you cannot do with a bike, but you could do with these types of vehicles. Um, summing up, um, so one, massive investment in micromobility in the different parts. Uh, two, People are interested in electric two-wheelers. Yes, this was a European study, but again, we could also find, uh, have similar findings for the US. And then mini mobility is very much about replacing private vehicles and replacing private vehicle journeys. It doesn't necessarily mean that people would get rid of their car altogether, but they would definitely keep it longer. They might replace a second or third car with a mini mobility vehicle. And for some people, it might actually be a good choice to have a, as a first vehicle. A few other things, uh, so our items 4 to 10 on the list, they aren't really new. We did share them in Amsterdam, um, uh, and uh, I also did a, a presentation on that at IA Mobility in, in, in Germany in September. But basically, we still are huge fans of the overall micromobility market, and it doesn't matter if it's going to be 360 billion by 2030, if it's going to be 400 or 300, and I'm sure that this number that we have here is not going to be the exact number we're going to see in 2030. That's just the nature of forecasts. But nonetheless, we are tremendously excited about the market, and we are very sure that it's going to keep growing. And the good news is it's going to keep growing on all fronts. So not only are we going to see growth in mini mobility, we're going to see growth in bicycles, we're going to see growth in scooters, we're going to see growth in form factors that we don't even know about today. And also are we going to see growth in sharing and in ownership. So it doesn't matter what pocket of the market you're in, it's always going to grow and it's going to grow quite massively. And why is that ultimately? Because um, these vehicles, they make sense and these vehicles can actually help us achieve our climate change targets. Um, electric bicycles is the next topic. So. Um, it's, it's a massive market. If we look at Europe, if we look at Germany, uh, they make up now more than half of the sales in terms of units when it comes to most countries. When we think about value pools, the share of electric bicycles is obviously even larger because the average electric bicycle is much more expensive than the average conventional bicycle. And we actually do believe that in some European countries, their share of traditional bicycles is going to go down to 15% or 20% in sales by 2030. So the electric bicycle is by far the dominating vehicle when it comes to this. And unfortunately, um, taking the US angle for a moment, Europe is a much faster growing market when it comes to electric bicycle because there's simply much more infrastructure and also much more governmental push to actually make that happen. So in Europe, almost every country has a clear cycling agenda to double bicycle miles traveled by 2027, 2030, depends on the country. And many companies, sorry, many countries are actually on a very good trajectory. So we looked into that for Germany recently, and Germany had a goal to double the bicycle miles by 2030. And we also were, we already were 70% of the way and much ahead of the target by end of 21. And yes, there was a COVID effect, 
but we can clearly see this going in the right direction and it's it's happening and, and users are accepting it and are doing it. Um, mini mobility, I think I talked about that. So massive market, we think it's a massive potential. It's still not there, obviously. So this is a theoretical market potential if everybody who says that they would actually use mini mobility would also do so. But we are very excited about this. Um, we did look into uh, regulation in, in micromobility and, and uh, it's a very regulated environment already today and we do believe that regulation is going to continue and it's going to become even broader and that more and more cities are going to regulate shared scooters. We actually think it's a good thing because one, um, if you have a, such an environment, you can actually make sure that everybody who's a stakeholder in the environment is happy with the fact that there are scooters out there if there are certain, certain things are being done. It's also going to make it safer for everyone, so that's another good thing. And if you do regulate it for most operators, it's actually going to be easier to forecast whether a certain city is going to be profitable or not. Because in some cities, especially if they are not regulated, but also if they are very highly regulated, it's very difficult to make, to make money off of that. We looked at different modes, bicycles by far the dominant mode, uh, simply because of people have known the bicycle for a very, very long time. But we can see equal interest or interest rising a lot in, in different types of modes coming up. Um, I talked about mini mobility uh, and then last but not least private ownership versus sharing. So for sure sharing is growing and sharing is something that many many people are excited about for certain modes of, of micro mobility. But ownership in our mind is always going to remain the dominant uh, uh, model. And then within ownership, like what I said about the two wheelers, we're going to see more and more people wanting to not pay the vehicle outright, but either do leasing, do subscription, uh, do financing, or also find other creative ways how they can actually do this and how they can get these vehicles. Um, I'm going to pick up Horace's question from the, from the talk from before. And I didn't come prepared, unfortunately, so I don't have a slide on that, but talking about or asking the question, answering the question, are industry leaders in the automotive industry and so on excited about micromobility, yes or no? I think it's a sort of question. It depends on who you ask. We do see a couple of companies in the automotive space and the OEM space going into it and either doing their own bicycle programs. Um, we do see lots of dealers, both in car dealerships, but also other types of dealerships getting more and more excited about selling bicycles selling other micro mobility vehicles because they need to sort of do more business, but also because they feel that this is very complementary to what they have as an offering. And we also see many of the suppliers, especially in the automotive space, getting excited about motors, about different types of the drivetrain and getting more and more uh, involved into this space. It is still sort of pockets and individual companies that are doing it. So it's definitely not an industry wide trend but at least it's happening and at least companies are getting interested in it. And in our mind, this is only going to strengthen the industry and also make sure that there are going to be more investments. Um, I think um, just as a, as a last note, what do we do as McKinsey? What do we do as a center for future mobility? So we want to work with the micro mobility ecosystem, with the mobility ecosystem. We can help companies basically boost sales. We can help companies um, get more efficient, improve profitability. We can also improve the likelihood of the success of the next funding round. And if there's an adjacent business that companies are building up, we're also happy to support that. And I've gotten that question already three times today. Whenever we work with startups and scale-ups, we have very creative ways of actually partnering up and making sure that this is digestible, even for a company that's not listed on NASDAQ, that's not a blue chip, and that is maybe trying to stretch the runway to the next funding round. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day.